Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris uh, Devona. It's good to meet you. Um, I'm here to introduce Chris Anderson to you and the offices that have VC'd in. Since we do have a number of offices VC in, and because it's the right thing to do, uh, if you have any questions, we do have a microphone set up in the middle of the room here uh, near the front. So feel free to line up and ask questions. Uh, Chris will talk about the parameters of question answering. It's very important that we get this right. Um, but I think he's pretty open to whatever you want to do there. Uh, we do have some books uh, available at what looks like a subsidized price uh, over here. And I think, Chris, you're going to do signings yeah. afterwards if you're up Absolutely. for that. Yeah. So he, his fingers have healed um, since his long book tour. Uh, I, I don't really need to introduce Chris too much. Uh, you know, we worked at a couple of small magazines, uh, mm -hmm. The Economist, mm -hmm. Wired, Nature, 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 Science. Nature, Nature Science. These little things. And, uh, and is uh, now currently wanted for... Uh, supplying uh, you know national security secrets in the form of drones uh, to the world. No, no, is that not true? It's not wanted yet. Not wanted yet. So that's good. Um, and maybe he'll talk about that in, in his talk that he's about to present today about his new book, Makers: The New Industrial Revolution. So, Chris. Thank you, Chris. It is. Uh, this is my. My favorite place to speak. This is uh, this is the the one the one uh, the one group where I feel like I can just geek out, and it'll be a good thing rather than the usual dazed looks I I, I get on this stuff. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is um, I think kind of a big deal. This is the basically industrialization of the maker movement, but I feel it's the the third wave of the of the digital revolution. You know, PC, web, and then the real world. Bring the web to the real world seems like a uh, seems like a pretty big deal to me. And um, what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through um, the evolution of what what is the, both the maker movement and its ultimate economic impact. What could be an industrial revolution, and then sort of give you an example of one bit of it in the form of my incredibly geeky um, hobby turned turned company turned God knows what um, in the forms of uh, drones and and robotics and all that. Um, we're going to go from 3D printers to, to um, I, you know, open supply chains and, and all that. But let me just sort of start with like one, one page of thesis. And then this will be like the last text you see. Um, basically, this is simply it. Uh, 20 years of finding a new way to work together, a new innovation model. That, well, that's what the web really is. It's an innovation model. Yeah, it's technology. You know, yeah, it's infrastructure. But fundamentally, what it unlocked is a exciting way to tap spare cycles, latent energies, talents that weren't otherwise tapped in the existing um, in, uh, in innovation models, and change the world. So we get it. But that's on the world of screens and bits. And we live in the world of atoms and real stuff. And if we can just apply that innovation model to everything else, just think what could happen. Um, we're starting to do that. But before we do, I just wanted to kind of, I, I use the word industrial revolution as on the cover of the book. And I, 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 that's a big word. You know, let's, let's, let's remember what an industrial revolution is. The first industrial revolution, um, um, oh, a little, little, we'll have a little quiz here. How many people, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you um, three centuries, and you can tell me when you think the Industrial Revolution. How many people think the Industrial Revolution happened um, in the 1700s? How many people thought it happened in the 1800s? And how many people think it happened in the uh, 1900s? Okay. Uh, the answer is 1700s. 1776, same year as the, as the American Revolution, was the um, deployment of the spinning jenny, which was basically a spinning wheel with multiple wheels. Now, we'd had spinning wheels since, you know, fairy tale times, castles and princesses and all this kind of stuff. But what a spinning jenny did is it used a foot treadmill and then just spun multiple wheels at the same time and amplified human power and basically turned, increasing, you know, continued the movement of moving us from muscle power to machine power. And that was first driven by, by feet and then by water and then by steam and ultimately created the factory. And so this is what you imagine. This is, this is, um, uh, this is sort of mid-1800s. Um, factory textile mill in, in England. Now, this, this did amazing things. Not only did it turn us from beasts of burden to, you know, to more using our heads, but it also concentrated us around the machines. Now, this is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's a good thing in that it created the city, it created urbanism, and you know, everything we now celebrate with 
concentrated populations. Um, it also in vastly increased um, quality of life. This is what happened to life expectancy um, as the factory was created, as we moved to cities. It doubled life expectancy. Now, you know, we think of rural England as being pastoral and wonderful and healthy and all this kind of stuff, but in fact, they had no access to clean water, no sanitation systems, the walls were damp, no access to good health care, et cetera. What cities offered, despite the whole, solar, solar, you know, the whole dark satanic mills and all this kind of stuff, what they actually offered was you know, sewage systems, um, uh, clean water supplies, um, health care, education, all these kind of things. And, and they um, very quickly doubled the, the life expectancy. And this is what they did to the population. That's what, that's what uh, concentrating us uh, around the tools of production did to the population of, the, of England and, you know, so, and then the rest of the world. Now, that's all good. Um, what was bad, or not bad, but the, one of the downsides of this is that basically it focused production around the things that made sense for factories, around massive economies of scale. So the things that got made were the things that got, they were mass produced. Now that's, that's great if you want cheaper spoons, but it really limits choice and variety. And so we ended up with that sort of, you know, Marxian um, construct of, you know, power going to those who control the means of production and, you know, the man uh, deciding what gets made. Uh, you just couldn't beat those economies of scale. Um, now, that is, now that is, you know, again, no bad thing. It improved quality of life and gave, uh, you know, access to high quality goods to everybody or to many people. Um, but we did destroy the cottage industry, we did destroy craftsmanship, art, artisanal uh, construction, and ultimately we ended up, um, as that trend towards cheaper labor continued, um, eliminating many manufacturing jobs outside of Asia. That was, but that was the first industrial revolution. That took us from about 1776 to, you know, mid 20th century. Um, then came the what we could call the second industrial revolution, which is the digital revolution. Now, I'm not showing the mainframe. And I'm not even showing a personal computer. Instead, I'm, I'm using a, a different construct here, which is the first, which is called publishing, if you will. Um, what I'm showing here is the first laser printer, the Apple uh, laser writer from 1985. It came out one year after the Mac and cost about $2,500. Um, now, that created desktop publishing. And today, we think nothing of desktop publishing. But at the moment, when that came out, these were mind-blowing words, you know, desktop publishing. Now, publishing was a, a factory job. It was, you know, if you, to publish, you had to buy ink by the barrel, buy paper, buy the railway car. Um, you needed to have a printing plant to publish. And now you could do the same quality production on your desktop. That's good. That's impressive. You know, hundreds of years of, you know, professional skills in publishing were turned into a bit of software and a button press. But you couldn't you couldn't really be a publisher because you couldn't distribute. You could make church newsletters and you know, missing cats, you know, posters, et cetera, but you couldn't make millions and get them out there. And then along came the web and publish turned into a button that you click on the screen. And every time you press the publish button, whether it's you know, on your blog or whatever, I mean, you don't think about it, but you basically turned you know, what used to be a, a industry run by factories and professionals and you've turned it into a single click. But that act of democratizing the tools of prototyping and then the tools of distribution basically took the publishing industry and opened it up to everybody. And we know, we know what, that, what happened. That was, that was the web and the long tail, and it changed the world. OK, but to take that two, those two analogies and now, and now fast forward. This is, rather than the laser printer, we have the 3D printer. This is the new uh, Replicator 2 from, from MakerBot. And um, it does the same thing as a regular, as a laser printer, which is to say it takes bits on the screen and turns them into atoms. Now a printer, 2D printer, takes bits on the screen and turns into ink or toner or things like that. A 3D printer takes images, polygons, designs from the, on the screen and turns it into a physical, physical object that's built up in layers of plastic or other materials. Um, but once again, it takes all the complexity out of the process. You don't need to know anything about plastic or machining. You just press a button and poof, out it comes. OK, that's great for making one or two or three of something. It's great for prototyping. They call it rapid prototyping. What about, but that doesn't make you a manufacturer. That doesn't make you a factory. The next step is actually less understood, but probably more exciting. And that is basically cloud, cloud manufacturing. Um, the world's supply chains are now impedance matched to the individual. 
Now, what does that mean? Um, what I'm showing here is a picture of Alibaba, which is one, one site among many, which gives you access to Chinese factories. Um, over the past decade, or a little less than a decade, three things have happened. And I'm using Chinese factories as one example, though it extends beyond them. Three things have happened to Chinese factories. First of all, the web generation has come into power. They get it. You know, you know, opening, open to, opening a web interface is the right way to work. Number two, their own manufacturing systems are increasingly robotic and automated, which means they are very flexible. They can make small batches, and they can change the design very quickly. And number three, they realized that serving small batches, serving sort of, you know, um, a niche interest actually is a higher margin business. That's the way they get out of the commodity trap is by, is by offering small batch custom bespoke uh, services. Now, I know this because um, about five years ago, I was messing around with my kids, and we came up with this, like, this, this really cool robot blimp, you know, using Arduino and some Lego parts, and it was really, we really, blimp, blimps are lovely. If you have kids, blimps are just the best thing to have around. Uh, they're, 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 like, they're like fish, and they sleep on the ceiling. It's great. Um, and um, we posted the designs online, and people were like, uh, yeah, that's cool. I just don't think I want to go to DigiKey and get these parts and solder them together myself. Could you please make a kit? And we're like, OK. Um, and uh, then I learned something about kit making. Um, when you're buying the components to a kit, don't buy them retail, because then the kit gets really expensive. Um, so I had to buy them wholesale. And there were, two, there were motors, two motors in particular. So I was like, I went out to Alibaba to find to find motors um, that I could buy wholesale. And it turns out that although they would sell me motors wholesale, they actually said, you know, it's just as easy for us to custom make them for you. What specs would you like? Shaft length, windings, motors, you know, voltages. And I was like, I don't really know. But they kind of walked me through with a form I could fill out. And um, then we did it. And then they g I gave them my credit card number. And 10 days later, I got a box of 1,000 motors with like kind of that little kind of greasy sheen because they just came out of the factory and this like you know foam layer between them with all these little it's all perfectly made in a layer of plastic and I was like oh my god I just got factory a factory in China I got robots in China to work for me and I didn't need anything more than a credit card now this may not seem like a big deal to you but I used to live in China and I can tell you it didn't used to be like that if you wanted a factory in China to work for you you had to fly to Hong Kong you had to use a facilitator or finder to make an introduction to a factory. Um, much trust or lack thereof you know, went, went on there. You then went across the border. You got that introduction. had a very awkward meeting. This involved then going to dinner together. You had to eat fish eyeballs, kind of a hazing ritual thing. Um, yeah, and then, and then, was the, 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 then more drinking, karaoke, and this went on. And then you had to get a letter of credit and then bank transfer. And then like six months later, after much negotiation, you, know, you might get your samples. And you had to be a company, by the way. Um, and I had just done it in like 20 minutes with a credit card. And I'm just a guy. And the mo at that moment, I realized that the world's supply chains had opened up to the individual. And it's only gotten better since then. So, that, so now we have this way. Um, because these, what the maker movement represents, what this part of the maker movement represents, is the web generation getting into physical stuff. And what that means is the designs start on screen. They start with a, with a digital design CAD file, typically. But, um, and it you know, could, be, could be electronics, could be physical. And you can print locally on your 3D printer or laser cutter or CNC. Or you can print globally by just uploading it to one of these services. And the machines speak the same language. In the desktop publishing era, it was PostScript. So the machine on your desktop spoke the same language as the biggest printers in the world. And now it's things like G-Code or STLs. Same language, scale agnostic. So we now have a scale-free manufacturing system. And that is the enabling technology of the long tail of stuff. OK, this is, this is what I suddenly realized as my, when that first box showed up. I was like, oh my god, this is like in my, I was like meant to do this. This is my grandfather. Uh, his name's Fred Hauser. Um, I hadn't forgotten about my grandfather, but I'd forgotten about this element of him until just till this happened. Um, Fred Hauser was a, um, a Swiss engineer who emigrated to Los Angeles in the uh, 1920s and worked in Hollywood. And by day, he, Hollywood was a very mechanical business in those days. There were, you know, the, the film transported lots of gears. Uh, the audio was lots of gears and pulleys and things like that. And so it was a kind of a place for a Swiss engineer with good at gears. Um, but by night, he was an inventor. And uh, this is what he invented, um, the um, automatic sprinkler system. So if you have an automatic sprinkler system, you have my grandfather to thank. By the way, this is exactly what a Swiss engineer would invent if you put him in LA. So LA is, you know, <laughs> greening the deserts with a uh, sprinkler system. And then the problem is that you had to like turn them on and off. And a Swiss engineer would just put a watch 
on top of a sprinkler system. <laughs> and you know those dials with the little pins that you put in? That's what, that's what he invented. So, cool, that was great. Um, this, was, this was not so great. This is what you had to do to get into market. You had to patent it. And he hated patenting, it was expensive, he hated working with lawyers, it took forever. Um, but, but after you patented it, you could license it to a manufacturer, and it, this was what was made, the Moody Rainmaster, which allowed you to, uh, to hang out at the beach while your garden watered itself. And um, this is a huge success, right? I mean, uh, this, is, this is a great victory of 20th century invention. His invention actually made it to market. He made some money. It, this is good. Almost nobody got this far. But it's also a little tragic in that he was an inventor, but he wasn't an entre entrepreneur. He never left his workshop. Um, he lost control of his invention. It got made by this company, and they changed it, and they kind of forgot about him. And I remember in the, in the late 1970s, when I'd go visit him, we, we went to see the factory. Um, he was proud that his product was being made, and, and it was clear they couldn't quite remember who he was and why he was there, and somebody finally reminded them, this was Mr. Hauser, who had invented the sprinkler system, and they were all very polite, but it was clear they didn't need him. They didn't want him there. Um, and, that, and that, you know, once this invention was done, that, 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 that they would take it from there. That, the men, that those who owned the factories, those who owned the means of production still controlled the product. I spent my summers with him, um, and he taught me how to do mechanical drawing, which I've entirely forgotten at this point. Um, and then he taught me, and this was kind of magical, um, how to use a metal lathe in a machine tool shop. Um, one summer, we, um, I think I was 12 this, year, this summer, uh, he said, this summer we're going to make an engine you know, an internal combustion engine. And I was like, cool. And he says, I'm an, I've ordered a kit. So I show up and, uh, and there's a box there, sure enough. And, you know, I knew what kits were, right? I built model airplanes. They were like, you know, lots of plastic parts and, you know, numbers and you know, instructions, et cetera. And we open the box and there's these four blocks of metal and a blueprint. And I'm like, Grandpa, where's the engine? And he's like, it's in there. We have to get it out. And we did, we did. You know, what a skilled machinist can do is take blocks of metal and put them on metal lays and curlicues build up around your feet. And it's like a sculptor cutting away the bit of marble that isn't the, the, the figure. It's absolutely spectacular and magical. And you can see that you can make anything if you have those skills. My grandfather was not just an inventor, he was a machinist. And you need to be a machinist to take your idea and make it real. And so I realized at that point, you know, as, as I was looking at this box full of motors that showed up from, from China, and like, I made that, oh my God, I, I, can't, I can't believe I can do that. Why had I forgotten that I spent my summers with grandpa making stuff? And I realized it's because I'm not a machinist, I didn't have those skills, and I had no way to get my ideas real until now. So when you get a 3D printer, and you know, my homework assignment for those, any of you who have children, but maybe even those who don't, is get one. It's mind-blowing, but when you get a 3D printer or a CNC machine or a laser cutter or just want to use these services, all those skills that you used to need to have go away. They're abstracted. The software handles that. And you know that barrier to entry of making things real has disappeared in the same way that that publish button on Blogger, etc., took away that barrier to entry of having to own a printing plant and understand the publishing industry. That is the magical thing here is that suddenly there's nothing standing between ideas and, and practice. And that step right now is optional. There's a movie that came out a few years ago called A Flash of Genius that was kind of a warning to those who would pursue invention in the 20th century. This is about the invention of the intermittent windshield wiper, which is basically the windshield wipers that pause um, when it's not raining very hard. It's just a little timer circuit. And um, there's a picture from the movie. This is guy, same deal, just like my grandfather, in his basement, comes up with the invention. He, too, patents it. Um, but rather than license it, he decides that he wants to be an entrepreneur. He decides he wants to make it, too. He wants to control his invention, understandably. Unfortunately, it was really hard in those days to make factories. So he mortgages his house, and he starts building a factory, rents some space. You know, uh, assembly lines come in, forklifts, people, you know, 1961, 62, 63, he's still not finished. Um, and in the movie, they portray the scene where he's, he's in 1964, he's leaving his still unfinished factory, it's raining, it's a little dejected, turns the corner, and the new 1965 Mustangs are turning the corner to be unveiled for the first time, and their windshield wipers are pausing. And he realizes that his idea has been stolen, and he's ruined, and he, his descent into madness then fuels the rest of the film, and it's all very entertaining, but there was a big, you know, the message was don't, dare do that. Don't be an entrepreneur in the physical space. It's too hard. 
you need a factory and factories are not for you. So that's the way it used to be. And, and this is the way it is now. Many of you may recognize this. This is Tech Shop, just down the road. This is the new factory. What you have here is basically a gym. Um, in the same way that a gym is a place where for a monthly subscription fee, you get access to machinery you couldn't afford or wouldn't want in your house, training, um, other people who are doing the same thing as an inspiration. This is that for manufacturing. You have access to 3D printers, CNC's, laser cutters, software tools, traditional machining tools, all this kind of stuff. They have trainers, they have classes, they have other people doing inspiring things. The guy here in the front is, uh, I don't know whether my, my laser pointer here works. Um, uh, the guy here in the um, front here is doing a um, wireless control module for the smart grid. Um, guy here right there is doing a vapor deposition chamber for synthetic diamonds. And in the back, they're building a lunar lander because why not? And what's great is because they start on screen as digital files, they then do some prototypes here and then they upload them to the cloud, more or less. And they can be manufactured at any scale. This guy, interestingly, his uh, wireless control modules, when he's, when he's done with them, they say ABB, which is a big Swedish uh, engineering firm on them. You probably think they're made in a big Swedish engineering factory, but they're not. Um, they're made uh, in small batches um, by this guy and his team um, and just simply distributed by ABB. But that's, that's, the, that's the power of this model. And because, it's, because these designs start digital and because the, the tools necessary to make them real are so easy and accessible, that you get this kind of long tail effect. You get, you get this explosion of entrepreneurship and innovation happening in uh, using the web model. Um, this is a, a map of um, the current spread of uh, maker spaces or hacker spaces. You, um, a tech shop is a kind of commercial chain. Actually, interestingly, uh, uh, the guy who runs tech shop used to run Kinko's. And if you think of it, Kinko's was was the sort of publishing industry turned into a, you know, a, a regionally distributed service. And tech shop is the manufacturing industry turned into a regionally distributed service. And, and these maker spaces are the same sort of thing. They're places where you can go. If you don't want to own your own 3D printer or laser cutter, you can, you can uh, just have access to one in a shared environment. Um, so these are spreading everywhere. And this is very exciting that it's not all clustered in the United States. It can really happen anywhere. And things like the Fab Labs that came out of MIT are a good example of this as well. Um, the funding model, of course, is Kickstarter. I don't really need to tell you more about Kickstarter and Pebble being one of the most successful projects, but, but basically it does three magical things. Um, the first magical thing Kickstarter does is it moves money forward in time. When you think about it, um, the traditional method of, of, of manufacturing has got, got the whole monetary flow all wrong, which is basically you pay, pay a lot of money up front to do your R&D and your prototyping and your tooling, and then you have to assemble your components, and inventory of components, then you have to do, you know, build the devices, then you have to warehouse them, then you have to put them into the distribution channel, then they sell, then, you, then they go through this, then the money kind of comes in, get, most of it gets taken away by third parties, and then you get paid. So all your money, you have to spend all your money at the front end in the process, and you get some of it at the back end of the process. And by simply taking pre-orders, they move the money forward in time to when you need it. So that's great, that's one thing. Number two is market research. Um, you have to, as you know, you have to pass your goal to get approved. Now in this case, the goal was 100,000. They kind of they blew through that one. Um, but um, if they hadn't, that would have been a gift. If you, if, if you don't pass, if you don't hit your goal, that tells you the product probably would not have sold. And you've just saved yourself a ton of time and money. Uh, right there. So, so free market research is, is, is golden. And number three, and this is like the most important thing, I think, is, the, is that um, is that builds a community. And this is a community of sort of customers, but not just customers. They're also co-participants in the product development itself. So if those of you who followed the Pebble Watch, uh, how many here back to the Pebble Watch? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one. This is, trust me, it'll come <laughs> sooner or later. <laughs> Um, to start a project and notoriously late. That's part of the, part of the fun, is just listening to the, the explanations of why things have been delayed. Very educational into like, the learning process of manufacturing. Um, so as, as though, those of you who backed will, will remember, uh, the community, after they, after they backed this product, started s making suggestions. We'd like it to be more waterproof. The guys, four guys in Palo Alto said, okay, we can do that. They said, well, you know, we'd like it to be Bluetooth 4, not Bluetooth 3. Gotcha, done. Um, we'd like a new color, fine. Done. 
And what that, ma what that means is that now these customers have a little bit of themselves in the product. They're not just buyers. They are, they are backers. They are participants. They are co-creators of something that's not just a watch. It's a, it's, a, it's a movement. It's something they believe in. And they become evangelists and then, and then marketers. I mean, it's not just the moment of backing when you tweet that, you know, I just backed whatsoever on, on Kickstarter, but also because they, they not only had bought into this and made a bet on something before it exists, but also contributed, many of them, to its essence. They really want this to succeed, and they will promote it in a way that no regular customer would. So it's a simple thing. Kickstarter, pre-orders, you know, threshold, comments, and what is created is a crowdfunding model that is perfectly suited for the industrialization of the maker movement. What these tools mean, so in the same way that that first desktop publishing software and that first printer meant that you were a publisher, but you have to get good at it, and we made these horrible messes of font, you know, dogs breakfast of fonts, and we knew nothing about letting and kerning and flow and wraparound, and, but we got better, we learned, um, and ultimately we got pretty good at it. We're right there with CAD, and manufacturing and everything else. It's like we're small d designers. Just like we became small p publishers the moment we hit that publish button, we're now small d designers. And hundreds of years of industrial skills and education are now turned into software apps. Um, I mentioned that my grandfather uh, invented the automatic sprinkler system. It's kind of a thought experiment. I said, well, what would grandpa do today? How would he invent the automatic sprinkler system today? And so, um, this really was a thought experiment because I don't even have a garden. Um, but but I, I just kind of said, well, he, so I just sort of said, I, what would an open sprinkler look like today? And I worked with a um, couple guys online, and we, um, this is what we came up with. Um, it is an Arduino-based Internet of Things sprinkler. Uh, you know, and we started to ask questions like, well, you know, again, how would you, how would you improve sprinklers? And well, obviously, sprinklers should be connected to the web. So if it's going to rain tomorrow, it doesn't water today. Obviously, you, know, you should be able to turn it off with your phone or any other device. Obviously, you should be able to plug in any sensor you want. Um, obviously, you should talk to other, other um, you know, devices in, in your house. Um, obviously, it should be open so anybody can build a community around it or find new applications. By the way, it turned out we then made it and sold it. it turns out the number one customer for this is uh, hydroponic pot growers, <laughs> which, we, which who turned out have very demanding sprinkler needs. I had no idea. Um, but but so, so this is just an example of what a guy who knows nothing about sprinklers and a couple other people on the web who I'd never met can do. And I'm not saying this is the best sprinkler. It's not, certainly not the only um, you know, web-connected sprinkler out there. But the point is, is that we did this in like you know, a couple weekends, and it's actually better than a lot of the stuff you can buy commercially, and it costs like 70 bucks. And there's no service fee for access to the weather reports because it's the web. So that was, that, was kind of, that was kind of my introduction into this whole thing. And I was realizing, you know, I, know, I really have no business doing this, and yet I, here I am doing it. I didn't have any business ordering motors from China, and there it was. I didn't have any business doing a sprinkler system, and there it was, and it's just so easy. And this made me realize that, you know, if I could do it, anybody can. Um, this is what, this is, these are the tools that we use. CAD used to be super hard. It's still not super easy, but it's getting easier, uh, and they're free. Um, Autodesk 123D is one free example. And the reason I'm showing you this is, is that there's, there's something that, again, is kind of mind-blowing if you think about it. So in your word processor menu, on, in Word or whatever, you go to the file menu, and, and there's an item that says print. And when you press print, it, like paper comes out of this machine. And we think nothing of it, right? It's a printer. That's what I do. Well, it is kind of magical, <laughs> you know, the whole kind of postscript and, you know, atoms into bits, and so bits into atoms and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, we're, we're used to it. Well, these CAD software programs now have a menu item that says make. And when you pick, this is, by the way, is the spring, this was the enclosure for the sprinkler system. This is my first CAD project. It turned out my walls were too thin. Um, uh, and, um, but when you, once I did it, and this took me you know, like, you know, 20 minutes, then you go to the make, and then it walks, there's a software wizard that walks you through these choices. Do you want to output it in, like, do you want to output it locally on your own machine, or do you want to upload it to a service in the cloud that'll, that'll do it for you in at higher resolution with better materials? Do you want to do it in 2D on a laser cutter, or do you want to do it in 3D on a 3D printer? Um, what, how much do you want to pay? Um, what kind of material properties do you want? Um, what are the volume considerations? How big do you want it to be? There's some cost aspects to that. And so basically this kind of stuff that used to be, and st you know, still is, you know, 
professional engineers, you know, entire industries focused on walking you through, you know, they focus on doing this, of walking, you know, of turning an idea into a product is now a software wizard that's just built into the, built into the program. This is kind of, again, amazing. This stuff used to be really hard, and now it just walks you through it and you put in your credit card. It's like Picasso. You know, you, you kind of, do you want to print your, print, your print your photo locally on your own printer, or do you want to upload it to a service to be turned into a book? It's like your choice. Print one, print 100. You know, one's free, the other has a credit card, but it's really just a matter of click here or click there. And now we're doing the same thing for manufacturing. Um, my daughters are, are, are one of the big users of all this in our household. Um, they're really into, um, the Sims, which is a uh, really cool uh, video game. We basically, it's basically a dollhouse. You build a house, you populate it with figures and, and furniture, and you design something that's it's just right. A um, lot of fun, but we're kind of fascist when it comes to video game time, and they get two hours per weekend day. And when the two hours are up, it's like, screen off, you gotta go play in the real world. By the way, you have a real dollhouse, so why don't you play with that? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, so, so it's not as cool. Look, you know, we've been designing this kind of madman theme in our, Sims dollhouse and our dollhouse furniture is all wrong. Dad, will you buy me some new dollhouse furniture? So I've heard that before, and yeah, I'm usually pretty good at no, but I want to do a little research, so I go on Amazon, and it turns out the dollhouse furniture is A, super expensive, B, very little choice, you can never get the, the right style, and C, it's always the wrong size. It turns out there's no, like, no standard size in dollhouse furniture, and, and you can't even tell whether it's the right size, and it turns out the houses and the figures are not actually scaled exactly the same. Very complicated and lots of disappointment lies ahead. <laughs> However, we have a MakerBot, we have a 3D printer, so we go to Thingiverse, and um, this is the coolest thing. This um, New York set designer who goes by the name, uh, you know, kind of the theatrical set designer, goes by the name of uh, Pretty Small Things, has uploaded the most beautiful dollhouse furniture designs for free on Thingiverse. And this, we found a chair that was just right, and then we printed it out, and then the, uh, the uh, four-year-old painted it. And uh, they love their dollhouse furniture now. Um, so if you're like a toy company, this should kind of fill you with terror. <laughs> we just, we basically did this for free. Um, the kids were super engaged. They got exactly what they wanted. And by the way, at exactly the right size, there's little sliders, so you scale, so it's just the right size. Then they made it their own with the painting, and they love this stuff. They treasure it. I mean, they actually take the dollhouse furniture out of the dollhouse, and they put it on their, on their windowsill because they're so proud of their dollhouse furniture. They don't feel that way about, about stuff they buy at Walmart. So is it better than the stuff they buy in the Walmart? No, but it's writer for my kids and there's something of them in them, in it. In the same way that you know, buying something from Kickstarter, there's a little something of you in it, you care more about it than you did from something you bought in a store. Something that you 3D printed and then sort of maybe painted or, 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 or customized, there's a, there's, a, there's a connection you have there. You value this more than something that's mass produced. Um, we've seen this before in music, right? I mean, the best music is the stuff that everybody else isn't into. You know, that's the story of the long tail, is that appealing to your individual needs, appealing to, your, to what defines you as a person, makes you value things more. You know, artisanal food, you know, I mean, you, you, we get it. This is, this, you know, we're, we're past one size fits all, and this is very much a one size fits one, one approach to dollhouse furniture. My boys, needless to say, are into Warhammer 40K mechs. Um, same deal, download the design, print it out, paint it, customize it. Um, you know, not as good as a, an official Warhammer 40K mech, but exactly what they want. Now that's just in our house, that's just, you know, I don't know what the killer app of 3D printer is, printers is, but I do know that when you give a kid a 3D printer and you have them, and they have access to Thingiverse and easy tools to customize, that the imagination runs riot. And someday, the, and they, what these kids know is that anything they can imagine, they can make real. Right now, they can make it real in plastic in one color. Soon it will be plastic in multicolors. Soon it will be sort of much higher resolution. Soon it will be multi-material. Then they'll be able to integrate um, the electronics into it. They'll be able to print in metal. I mean, you know, we can see the way this is going. It's not going to take 20 years to get, you know, professional quality manufacturing on your desktop. The, you know, we're, we, we're in the, we've been in the dot matrix period, we're now in kind of in the you know, inkjet period. We're gonna get, we're gonna get better faster because it's built on the same technologies as, as traditional printing. You know how um, Apple's slogan when it released the iPod was rip, mix, burn, and that changed the music industry. The idea that you could take music, professional music, and you could rip it, you know, bring it into your computer, then you could change it, mix it, then you could, produce it, then you, could, then you could make your own CDs and distribute them and burn them. 
that was, you know, that, that idea, that, that sense of control, that sense that, that the tools of production now were in th within your reach, that was incredibly powerful. And it was scary for the music industry, but it, was also, it also unleashed this explosion of creativity and changed the music industry, I think, for the better. Adobe's slogan is rip, mod, make. And wh what does that mean, rip, mod? How do you rip physical stuff? And the answer is called reality capture. You take your, I mean, right now, what, we're, what you're seeing right there is, a, is an app which is free on uh, iPhone or uh, iOS, uh, I, iPhone and iPad, which uses the camera to just, you just take the pictures, you move around an object, go click, 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 click. It sends the pictures up into the cloud, it stitches them together, and it then generates a polygon mesh. Um, it, it scans reality. We can now capture reality at relatively low resolution, but they get better. So 3D scanning, which used to be really hard, is now a free app in your phone. And, and what you do with it is you then you know, output the mesh, you then clean the mesh up, and then you, of course, print your head as a pest dispenser, as one does. <laughs> That's rip, mod, make, right? Okay, it's a trivial example, but think how powerful that is. We now have, we don't have to, we don't have to learn CAD tools. We can just capture reality and fix it, make it our own, adapt it, and then print it in whatever material we want. You know, we saw what it did to the music industry. Just imagine what this might do to everything else. So what does this, you know, does this pull back? What does this mean for the world? What does this mean for, for industry? What does this mean for the economy? Um, I think when I, I started by saying that, this is, that, the, that the real revolution of the web was the innovation model, the fact that we were able to bring everybody in and get them to work together. And we now have an opportunity to do this with physical goods. I think what this creates is a different kind of company. The guy on the left here is Ronald Coase. He was the University of Chicago economist who came up with the so-called theory of the firm. In the 1930s, um, he was puzzling over the question, why do companies exist? You know, why do we go to work under one roof and for one company and with one job description and you know, with an aligned mission, why do we do that? Why have we created the corporation? And he came up with the, the theory of transaction costs. We, we, we work for a company, you guys stay here and work for, for Google because it's the fastest way to get things done. Transaction costs are the cost of communicating with each other. And because each of you has a role and responsibility, you know who does what. So accounts receivable is here and accounts payable is there. And you know, you know how to find the person to get stuff done. That's great. 20th century, thanks, thanks you for that. Um, and, it's, and, it, and it worked fine. Um, however, the guy on the right, Bill Joy, one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems, um, accepted that and he worked for a company, but he did reflect on one of the truisms, which is, he said, whoever you are, the smartest people in the world don't work for you. This is probably the one place in the world where that's not true, but, <laughs> but, but it was it generally a truism, which is to say, statistically speaking, for any given job, you know, the smartest person in the world is not the person who has that, who has that sort of defined role and responsibility and is in the cubicle next to you. They're probably out there somewhere. They're probably in China or India or whatever, but, but you know, how are you gonna find them, right? You know, the transaction costs of finding the statistically smartest person in the, job for that, in the world for that job are too high. So you settle for the one you're with. By the way, if you think about this, it's probably true for your spouse as well. And we just didn't, don't, don't go there. We'll go absolutely crazy. You know, the odds that this the perfect person for you happen to grow up in your town. Um, so we love the one we're with. Um, um, ho however, you know, that's suboptimal. Um, and he's like, you know, what we're settling, what we, what we do with things like, you know, what school did you go to? What grades did you get? Let me see your CV, your track records. You know, let's get the references. Are you available? Do you speak the right language? Do you have the right visa? Those are not talent optimizing. They're basically access optimizing. What we're doing is we're settling for the safest person in the world. We know this person can do the job. Um, and that the 20th century talent filters were largely oriented around minimizing the, 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 uh, the difficulty in finding someone who could do the job. But we didn't end up with the right person. We didn't end up with the best person for the job. So I wanted to kind of end with a story about, about my own little adventure in this and, and how we may have solved Joy's paradox. This is the cover of Make Magazine, which is kind of the uh, Bible of, of the movement, and um, the, the maker movement. And, um, my little adventure with um, my children, starting with blimps, kind of went down the rabbit hole. I'll show you in a few minutes, but, uh, but I ended up getting into drones. And um, I built a community, and I met that guy there, Jordi Munoz. And I just want to tell a little story about Jordi, um, and then we'll end and we'll take questions. Um, 
so I, so my, my only invention, my own invention of this started with trying to get my kids interested in science and technology. I started a site called Geek Dad, uh, which is now run by other people, but this is my eternal and eternally unsuccessful quest to get my kids more geeky. Um, I got five kids, um, I, and I just, every weekend, I try to find projects that were fun, science and technology projects that were fun for them and fun for me. So one Friday at the office at Wired, we got in a Lego Mindstorms kit, and this is right when they, before they came out, so we got one of the first ones, and we got a radio control airplane. I thought, best weekend ever, right? So on Saturday, we're gonna make a robot in, out of Lego, and on Sunday, we're gonna fly a plane in the park. How could this go wrong? This is Erin, she was nine. Um, she's building the first project of the Lego Mindstorms. It's a tribot, it's a three-wheeled um, robot. And um, what you do is you put together the robot and then you, um, and then you use uh, this kind of uh, uh, visual programming language um, built on LabVIEW to kind of program it. And um, there's Daniel, uh, 11, and he's um, getting ready to push the button and see whether it will work. Uh, so what it does is it goes forward until it sees a wall and then it backs up. And my kids are like, you got to be kidding, right? We've seen Transformers. We know what robots are supposed to do. Where are the lasers? You know, <laughs> this is not a death dealing, three story killing machine. The, 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 Hollywood has ruined robotics for children. Uh, you cannot compete with CG. So they were really disappointed and, and lost interest entirely. And so I was a little upset about that. Um, so I said, okay, that was Saturday. On Sunday, we're going to fly a plane. We, we got, this was the plane we got. And so we went to the park and we'd seen YouTube videos and it looked awfully cool. Um, and this is what happened. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I flew into a tree and, and if that weren't humiliating enough, it was, it was dad climbing into the tree to get back, which is completely mortifying. And I, I had to bribe them with ice cream and, and it just was, it was a bad scene. And, they, and, they, and once again, they were reminded that anytime dad wants to do science and technology projects, it ends up as a disaster. Um, so I was kind of annoyed about the whole thing and kind of went for a run to clear my head. And I was out there thinking, I was like, that sucked. Um, you know, I, A, the robots weren't very fun. They just ran into a wall. And B, I can't fly. Um, I thought, God, you know, I bet the Lego could have flown that plane better than me. And then I thought about the sensors that came in the kit. And it came with a gyro sensor and accelerometer. It's called tilt sensor. And, uh, and a magnetometer, which is called a compass sensor, and a Bluetooth connection, which you could connect. And I was like, oh my god, you could almost build an autopilot out of this. So I came back and I said, okay, kids, one last thing. We're going to, we're going to build an autopilot. And this is what we came up with. And this is, this is, this is a Lego autopilot. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's got gyros, accelerometers, magnetometers, a RC interface. It um, actually runs a Kalman filter. I actually had to Google Kalman filter. Um, that, was, that was actually harder than I expected um, to, to implement. Um, I knew nothing about this, but it kind of almost worked. Um, we put it in a plane. Um, it actually kind of flew on its own. Um, this we posted on Slashdot. Uh, this is, I think, technically the world's first Lego unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV. Um, it's now in the Lego Museum in Billund. Um, which, which we're very proud of. We got to, you know, the kids got, and I got to go to uh, Lego for, to Billen for that. Um, and, um, and, and we later, and we learned a lot uh, about this. We learned A, that um, this stuff is not that hard. Uh, B, that what's going on with the smartphone revolution, you know, what's going on in your pocket, that, that, the, that the revolution in MEM sensors and ARM processors and, and GPS and wireless and cameras and memory and, and, and integration, all this kind of stuff, um, this, is driving a, this is driving a technological wave that's we've only seen the beginnings of. Um, I just realized after I, thanks to Mindstorms, that you can fly a 747 with this. You know, with the right app and the right cable, this, you've got, a, you know, not terribly well, I wouldn't recommend it, but you've got all it takes. And that just as Jobs and Wozniak realized that that original, what was it, an 8088 processor, et cetera, was, was sort of like available and relatively cheap and easy to use, and then you could maybe build a computer out of it, and that ended with, end up with the Apple II and changed the world, we're right there with, with the guts of a smartphone right now has extraordinary applications outside and being able to fly a plane is just one of them. Now in the course of doing this, we learned a lot. We, also, we learned that um, autopilots are, are considered uh, cruise missile controllers um, by the uh, State Department's International Trade and Arms um, Regulations, ITAR, and um, that by uh, my nine-year-old developing an autopilot and putting it online that we technically weaponized Lego. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it was, it was, it was quite a learning process. Um, uh, so what I did is I decided to just sort of learn in public. So I started a community called DIY Drones and just basically shared my ignorance. I knew nothing. And I just kept asking dumb questions like, you know, what's a common filter and, well, you know, and, and you know, uh, digital electronics and analog electronics and aerodynamics and, you know, dynamic systems and control theory. And I'm nothing about this. Um, and I just kept sort of uh, everything I found I shared and people kept answering my questions. And today we're one of the biggest robotics community in the world. And we um, are collectively, and people here in Google who are, part, who are members, and, and Apple, and Microsoft, and IBM, et cetera, and by day they do awesome work here, and by night they do awesome work in autopilots and drones, et cetera, because they're really into it. And um, we ended up um, kind of by accident competing with the aerospace industry. We, uh, this, is, this is what we do. We make these autopilots right now. This is, um, we work with ETH and Zurich, uh, which is a... Uh, the Swiss, by the way, turn out, thank you, Grandpa, turn out to be um, the leaders in robotics because all those watchmakers had extraordinary mechanical skills and robots used to be mechanical. And now ETH and EPFL, which are the two leading universities like the MIT and Stanford. Um, I, though I, when I ask them to make that connection, they say, well, no, the most important thing is one's German speaking, one's French speaking. So you can't really make the MIT Stanford <laughs> connection. But anyway, they're really good. Um, and um, so when we work with them, and, um, and this is like the stuff we make now um, this is kind of like, you know, this is like military grade uh, autopilots, which are built on smartphone chips and sell for 140 bucks. Um, you know, the Parrot AR drone, which many, some of you may have, and um, it's a lovely piece of gear. It's a quadcopter that you can control with an iPhone or an Android. Um, it's not really a drone. I hate to tell you, drones are autonomous. Fully autonomous, t automatic takeoff, landing, missions, GPS coordinates, etc. The AR drone is, is teleoperated, it's remote control. Unless you rip out the guts and put in our stuff, and then, and then it's a real drone. So that's kind of where we're going on this. Um, just a little sort of segue into, into what, why, we're do why this is happening now. It turns out that these multi-copters, these quadcopters, are basically solid state devices, but, but um, they don't have any moving parts except for the motors themselves, but they could not, were not possible until about a decade ago because they're essentially unstable. You can't fly them manually. You need a, you need a basic computer on board to spin the props, and, you know, to go clockwise, to go out counterclockwise, and just getting the math right um, needs to happen at 400 times a second, 400 hertz. Um, but once you get it right, you can do all sorts of uh, amazing configurations. Um, it's just math, right? It's just, it's just these, these, uh, these lookup tables that can control any shape, how, how big a camera you want to lift, whether you want to have um, you know, an open uh, field of view for a, for a camera, um, whether you want redundancy of motors, et cetera. This is, it's just math. And uh, it's really kind of exciting that you can now, now come up with these extraordinary un, and, and before impossible configurations of aircraft and fly them with an autopilot that costs you know, just over $100. Um, so we ended up the, with this. We started with the Arduino platform. Um, and uh, actually, I have uh, one of the autopilots here. I'll just grab it here. Uh, it, this, this, is, this is an autopilot right here. It's just a little box. Um, and uh, you put, it, uh, put this little box in any vehicle, and it suddenly becomes a fully autonomous drone, including a car. We, not quite as good as your autonomous car, but <laughs> you know, this one's a lot cheaper. And, um, <laughs> You know, you can put in anything. I, won't have, I don't have to have a boat up there, but you can do boats, et cetera. But just, it's just kind of magical. This is a, basically a, a, a triple core Arduino board, GPS, lots of sensors, et cetera. You just stick this in any vehicle, and suddenly it's like, you know, it's like a military-grade UAV minus the weapons, of course. Um, and then you, uh, you've got these ground stations, and you just point and click waypoints, and you give mission commands, and it's scriptable, and you can script it in Python or just, or just manually like this, and automatic takeoff and landing and loiter and camera control. And we have this cool follow me function where, where you have a, a box that looks a little like this, and you're, let's say you're windsurfing out there on the bay, and um, you're really doing well, and you totally, and this is the GoPro era, right? You totally need this on YouTube. Um, so what you just do is you just push the button on your, on your in, you know, in the box, and your quadcopter with the, uh, with the GoPro takes off from the beach, comes out to you, positions itself 30 feet behind, 30 feet above you, and then just follows you around as you do your thing with the camera focused on you the whole time. And when the battery gets low, it flies itself back to the beach. Um, that's the follow me function. That's like, you know, you know, the droids, you know, the personal droids from Star Wars, right? This is, this is now possible. I mean, there are people doing it right now. Um, and 
you know, this didn't come to you from Boeing or from Lockheed Martin. It came to you from a community of amateurs. Although, you know, we all have day jobs, but by this, we're amateurs working together using the web's innovation model and open platforms like, our, like Arduino. Um, so what we, what we ended up doing was being, and we ended up part of the open hardware movement. So if you make your bots open hardware, and there's a number of others, but this is where we sort of realized that, that by accident, we'd created this really, we figured out a way, along with many others, to industrialize the maker movement. We give away the bits in the community. The software is all, is all open, and then we s sell the atoms in the form of hardware with a, with a robotic company. And we end up, we don't have the best technology in the world, but we have the cheapest technology in the world, and we have the best innovation model, which is open. And the ability to apply this kind of the web's innovation model to physical goods is, is the real tool here, just in the same way the web you know, the technologists created TCP IP and HTML, et cetera, but we, the regular people, filled it with our ideas, and that's right where we are with hardware. The technology is there and easy and sort of in place, and now we can just fill it with our ideas. Um, and the nice thing about hardware is that there's no, there's no crazy debate over the business model. The business model is you sell products for more than they cost, period. That's it. You know, it, it, business school professors keep saying, explain your business model. It's like, we sell products for more than they cost. Uh, that's, we made money on day one. Um, we actually sell it at 2.6 times, um, times the actual cost. Uh, 2.6, uh, the, the cost is the bill of materials plus labor. And 2.6 is like this magic number. It's basically two 40% margins, one for us and one for our distri distribution partners, a wholesale and a retail margin, if you will, 2.6. 2.6 times the bill of materials is like an order of magnitude cheaper than closed source, sometimes two orders of magnitude cheaper. It's, it's not rocket science. It's, you know, we learned it from other people in the open hardware uh, uh, movement, but it works great. Um, and the customers do the product development for us. They design the products for us. They then give it to us. We then sell it back to them. If it's not right, they fix it for us. If, you know, if it needs customer support, they do the customer support for us. They write the documentation. It's, they fix our, you know, they, they, they catch our bugs, they do our regression testing, it's just wonderful. Um, now, it's also an incredible obligation and responsibility, and we spend, every morning I wake up to lots of customers with lots of demands, but the point is, is that, is that the web's innovation model works in the real world, and, you know, I've, we've seen what it does in electronics, but just imagine what it can do in everything else. Um, so I just wanted to end with that story of Jordi. I told you about Jordi, uh, I showed you a picture of Jordi Munoz, and I just wanted to tell you what happened. So in, when we started DIY drones, it became clear that we needed to make a company. That people was like, you know, we, we like put the files out there and we said, here, here's the PCB file, just have it batched. And then, you know, order the components from DigiKey and then solder it. Come on. And people were like, could you do that for us? Because that sounds actually kind of hard. And we said, okay. And so we started on the kitchen table, you know, hand soldering, and that was no fun. And then we sent it to China and realized that, you know, when you have to get economies of scale, you have to order a thousand, which means that if it's wrong, you just have a thousand dead boards. And also, if you, if you order a thousand boards or 10,000 boards, you actually have to sell them before you change the design, or else all your money is sunk in dead boards. Um, and so we then brought it back. And we said, well, we'll do our own manufacturing. We'll start a factory. And so we started, we started in a garage, as one does. There's Jordy on the right. Um, and, um, oh, by the way, Jordy was the guy who just was doing the cool stuff in the forum. He was flying a helicopter with a Wii controller. And he posted YouTube videos and he showed he could do it. And so I'm like, that, is, that guy is awesome. He knows, he knows all the cool stuff. He turned me on to Arduino. And I was like, Jordy, you want to start a company together? And he said, sure. And I said, tell me a little something about yourself. And he turned out to be a 19-year-old from Tijuana, just graduated from high school. And uh, today, He's uh, the CEO of 3D Robotics. This is, like, well, this is like a tiny corner of one of our two factories. We have one in San Diego and one, one in Tijuana. Um, uh, we've got something like 24,000 square foot of pick and place lines and CNC machines and you know, like, like 50, 50 workers right now and engineers. And we put twice as many drones in the air as the US military. Um, our drones cost $600 and are made out of plastic and theirs cost six million and are not made out of plastic. But still, we've got 15,000 of them out there, and the military has seven. So, and Jordy built this by basically buying, you know, the first pick-and-place machine we got on eBay, and he looked at the, the manual on, on Google. And today we run, we're going for ISO 9000 compliance, and, you know, that was three years. So that's the answer to Joy's paradox. You know, 10 years ago, when the editor of Wired was going to start a drone company, what are the odds that he'd end up with a Mexican teenager from Tijuana? And yet, 
that was the best person in the world for this job, that he was the smartest person in the world. He failed all the 20th century tests of talent acquisition. He did not speak the right language, go to the, come from the right country, have the right degree or any degree, have any professional experience. Nothing, he would have failed. He would not have worked. Maybe, maybe your, your admission standards have changed at Google. But, <laughs> but by and large, I suspect he would have failed your tests. And yet he passed the test of the web's, the web's talent discovery model, which is that he could do it. And he showed it, he showed what he could do. And by the time, by the time that it came, you know, we actually asked him questions like, you know, tell me a little something about yourself, it, it didn't matter anymore. He'd already proven his ability to do it. And today, it turns out it's the best thing in the world. Um, I, you know, you may think that I, I thought I was picking him because he was, he knew a lot about technology and he was really innovative and he turned me out to Arduino. But in fact, his real asset was that he turned me out to Mexico. And today, the reason when we have a, a second plant in Tijuana, we have access, you may think of Tijuana as being cheap tequila and drug cartels, but it's the Shenzhen of North America. Um, all these screen, every, every screen here was assembled in Tijuana. The Samsungs and the Sonys have massive plants there in the special economic zone. Mexico graduates more engineers in the United States, 55,000 a year. Um, we are outside of the export control zone in Tijuana. We have access to ISO 6,000, 9,000 you know, engineers and operations managers who we could never find or afford in, in San Diego. We are, um, now I'm, a, I'm in the Maquidora. I'm a Mexican you know, high-tech entrepreneur. I mean, how did this happen? Um, but the, the answer is Jordi. He taught me everything about the stuff that, that really mattered, which was how do, you, how do you bring manufacturing back to North America? How do you do high tech built on the web's innovation model? How do you compete with the aerospace industry with a bottoms up homebrew computing club model? It turns out he knew that. That's, I didn't know I needed to know that, but he just knew that. And because he'd proven himself in the community, he was the right person to do it with. So there's the answer to Joy's paradox is the web, you know, you don't find people, the right people on the web, they find you. You put your idea out there, you start something, you, you share your ideas, and the smartest people in the world will find you for their reasons. And ultimately, they, decide, they turn out to be the, the secret to this new industrial model. So with that, I wrote, this is all sort of described and much more with, with uh, many other examples in the book that came out last week. Um, but uh, thank you very much. I'll take your questions. Thank you. So two questions, uh, if I could. Uh, the first is, when do you see uh, more advanced materials and potentially even molecular synthesis yeah. being a feature of 3D printers? Uh, the second is, uh, I, a, a little under a year ago, saw this coming too and, and bought some stocks. I bought 3D systems at, at a pretty Good reasonable choice. PE. Um, but I think if there's other recommendations that you have in terms of companies that are sort of going to yeah. be uh, paid off because of because of the trend, uh, sure. I see just the prototyping getting more and more, not only for individual makers, but also probably replacing uh, the lower segments of production manufacturing as a whole right. as well. Okay, um, second question first, uh, in terms of the other companies that are leading this, Autodesk is, is doing tremendously well. They're, they're really pivoting towards recognizing that um, design um, is now a democratized skill, so it's gonna end up in curriculums and making it free on, on, on uh, Android, and uh, well, actually they're on iOS at the moment, but. But anyway, Autodesk is a good choice. Uh, 3D Systems is doing good work. MakerBot is not public. You can't in invest in it at the moment, but they're, they're obviously doing good work as well. Um, I, you know, we, we, we also use SolidWorks and a couple others, but I, I would say um, you know, buying Autodesk is not a bad, a bad uh, way to <laughs> expose yourself to this. Um, uh, your second question about the materials. So right now you can upload your, um, your, your stuff to uh, services like Shapeways or Pinoco. Uh, you don't need to own it to own a printer yourself, and they can print in um, a range of materials: uh, glasses, metals. They can do titanium, uh, gold-plated, um, etc. Um, on your desktop, I think the next. So right now we're in sort of the one-color ABS plastic and PLA, which is a starch-based material. Um, uh, you can now buy pretty easily two colors, which you can kind of mix on layers, but not in intertwine. Um, soon we'll be able to mix three colors simultaneously. So then you can put. Then you can put. Um, you know, images and shapes and sort of texture or color um, onto, the, onto the object. So now you can simulate what you can do with a combination of injection molding and, hand, and, and, and stenciling. Um, other materials are coming in. Um, right now, the, the first thing is to bring hard and soft materials into the same 
into the same mix. Uh, the next thing is um, uh, to bring um, some of these simple electronic layers. And I say electro electronic, I really mean electrical layers. So wires, putting in a layer of wires. It's uh, going to be a little harder to do uh, to do, uh, do multi-layers of electronics, um, like semiconductors I think would be very, very hard. But you can start to see that printed circuit boards are going to be something that you can actually print um, as well. Um, you know, then you, go, then you go on like there, you can start bringing in metals, etc. cetera. Um, you know, obviously you're dealing with thermal properties and cooling, et cetera, so it's non-trivial, but, but you, you know, there's nothing, laws of physics don't stand your way. Then you project, project way out and you start looking at things like biology. Um, so right now we can already print with stem cells and create things that are biologically active. They're not, you know, you can print a kidney but not a working kidney because the vascular system is not in there. But you can kind of see where this is going. Um, maybe you're just printing the matrix on which the cells exist and then you infuse them with live stem cells. And they... Anyway, um, you know, I don't want to get too kind of crazy mm -hmm. and scary what, there. What's but... the horizon though for the sort of more advanced materials? Um, I would say that we're looking, I would, I would look at full color 3D printing within five years on the desktop and multi-material including, including um, electrical circuitry within seven to eight. Thank you. Thank you. What's the status of like uh, getting mechanical stuff made up out of like interchangeable parts? It seems like overly custom, right? I'd like to make a design and then send it out and you know, have it made up and just have that happen the same way circuits are happening now. So I, I didn't quite understand. You said this test getting mechanical what? parts. Yeah, can I do can I do mechanical CAD and just have it sent out and have it made and it's all like known stuff and this just oh, works and it's it's already solved. Yeah, yeah, you can. So so right now you can you can uh, take your your CAD file and upload it to Shapeways and be made in, in any in any uh, uh, material you want. If we rather have it sort of machined rather than three D printed, there's other companies like MFG.com um, which will basically do CNC uh, for you. Um, Typically, what you, you, you can have a single file which has all the moving parts printed at the same time, manufactured at the same time. Those things tend to be a little clunky. Um, but it's uh, better, so gears might be made, want to be made out of one substance, and the enclosure might, might want to be made out of another. Um, no, but like a service bureau that makes the whole thing for me, say. Uh, give me an example of how complex the product is. Uh, an RC, RC car. Okay, that's that's really complex. So that's well, okay. Not just not skip the radio, just the uh, the car part, motors and gears and wheels and e even even that is relatively. Yeah. Good. So so right now you can so you can go to Thingiverse right now and download all the all the um, body parts of an RC car. Um, so they already have that right now. But you, but you have to then buy a bag which has the motor and and the radio parts. Um, if you want to. So what you're describing, I mean, any one of those things right there is, is basically uh, about as complex as you can get, right? You have lots of materials, some of them are machined, some of them are printed, some of them are injection molded, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, you know it, it, we, we haven't gotten to the replicator yet. You can't just sort of say, you know, watch, and it'll print it all out. No, but like, a f basically, I'm thinking just a factory, and, you know, I kind of send them to design, and, you know, oh, they yeah. build so, it, and back so that, it comes. So, so that, that is actually something uh, which, more like Alibaba. So what you would do, or MFG.com. So let's say you would take some, some mechanical um, device, a, um, a clockwork. Um, that, you'd, you'd probably send it to MFG.com and get a quote, or send it to Alibaba.com and, 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 and get a quote. Um, back. And what you'd find is that it's actually probably being made with a combination of manual and automated work, largely CNC work, but they've abstracted so much of it and sort of built on standard materials and you've uploaded your CAD file so you have certainty that they're going to make what you want, that it might as well be automated. And, you know, literally two weeks later, three weeks later, you got it. Yes, sir. Um, you talked about uh in the publishing revolution, people figured out fonts and kerning and all this stuff, but I don't think uh, end users figured that out. It was just that the software got to that point. Yes, exactly. And you kind of alluded to that with like the the three D, uh, you the know, one two three cat the three yeah, reality the 3D capture, scanner yeah. thing, and then some of the uh, some of the software. But I was wondering uh, what what's remaining for it to really become. Uh, where do you see that analogy playing out? Where we all have good enough software that prints posters and prints stuff for us yeah. that we don't think about it? That's a great question. It's a really interesting information problem. Um, so right now what it does is, right now the, the wizards will walk you through a relatively simple process, which is basically do you want to output it in 3D on a 3D printer, you want to output it in 2D in, 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 in layers. So that's, that's you start there. Then they walk you through some material choices. And this is based on both structural, um, uh, you know, considerations and cost considerations. Does he want to be wood or, or cardboard or plastic or metal or glass or whatever? 
Um, then they walk you through some volume that you can sort of make, this, make the model a little simpler, um, sort of remove some internal surfaces and reduce the cost and the weight and, and, and things like that. So that, that's kind of what, where, where they're at right now. Um, what they're not, now when you go to high-end CAD, then the, then the CAD program itself is able to do things like complex fluid dynamics and um, finite element analysis, and they start to go through the physics of the materials themselves. And they'll start to do things like, well, you know, this, this wall is too thick, you know, it doesn't need to be that thick, and this wall is too thin, you know, here's a, here's a kind of a flex point which needs to be bolstered. Um, you might, you know, pick a different material here given the, you know, the strength considerations, weight considerations, things like that. That's kind of high-end stuff, but it's increasingly within a plug-in. On some of these, um, on some of these free tools, you can download, you know, CFD or, or, or finite element analysis, uh, you know, tools. And then you move to the next level, which is like, let's say you want to injection mold something. Um, so it's very easy to come up with it to, to to 3D print your part. You've got your prototype. Then take the inverse and CNC it. Now you got your mold. Okay, that's great. Except for actually flowing plastic into a mold is kind of is not trivial. Um, it's easy to put it in, but the problem is the plastic shrinks, and you want the shrinkage. You know, it basically goes in one place, and you want the shrinkage to to avoid distortion. So, like guys who have been doing this forever know exactly how to design a mold so the plastic flows perfectly and then shrinks at an even rate, and you get you get high yield. Right now, that's basically smart people who've been doing it forever. <laughs> but there's no reason why it can't be software, and I'm sure if you have enough money, there is software out there that does it right now. But there's still an element of craftsmanship that's in manufacturing. Hi, I have a question as to <laughs> as to how accessible you think this revolution really is. You know, when we're talking about people who might not even have internet connections, who don't have you know a thousand or more dollars to buy a maker bot, yeah. um, and you know whether this revolution may just exacerbate the effects of the digital divide. Well, it's, a, it's certainly a lot more accessible than it ever has been before. Um, so one of the things that Neil Gershenfeld at the MIT Media Lab, or now actually the Center for Atoms and Bits, um, did was, um, with his fab labs, was specifically target you know, Africa and other places that, you know, that didn't have access to this, largely because these are people who really don't, you know, we have access to you know, highly manufactured quality parts because we have Walmarts and all that. They, they typically don't, and so there's a notion of self-empowerment in that. Um, Obviously, you have problems like you know the technology is still relatively expensive. You need electricity, internet connection is good, um, et cetera. I think what you're finding is pu putting like I think electricity is kind of a, a necessary element, <laughs> you know, still. But putting that aside, um, one of the uh, you know so so let's just start with the barriers to entry. The, the barrier to entry used to be you needed you needed machining skills. You don't need that anymore. Then the barrier to entry is you need this machine, and now you can either afford the machine or you can have access to it via service. Then the next barrier to entry was CAD. CAD was super hard. Um, Check out Tinkercad, um, which is a web-based um, CAD program. It looks very toy-like and you know, game-like on, on, on the surface, but underneath it's got a, actually it's run by a, a former Google engineer. Um, it's got a is very- Is it free? Sorry? Is it free? A absolutely free. Absolutely, that's the point. It's, 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 it's the web. <laughs> I wrote a book on that as well. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but underneath it's got a very powerful um, uh, engine, uh, you know, basically a uh, um, you know, polygon uh, you know, construction engine. Um, and that feels, a lot of the sort of arcane language of CAD is, 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 is abstracted away in that. And then finally, you know, Minecraft. You know, you don't think of Minecraft as a CAD program, but it is. And so I think the kids really, kids really understand 3D spaces and polygons and navigating, you know, these kind of screen environments. And if you can, if you can, if you can navigate Minecraft, you can basically navigate a CAD environment. And, and um, Lego Digital Designer is a good example of that. Um, one of the nice things about Lego is that it's, it's a smart material and that, and that the pieces know how they fit together. You can't kind of put them together wrong. They snap, they sort of snap into, into, into alignment. And um, what uh, Lego Digital Designer is is CAD for Lego, but allows you to create you know, relatively complex um, you know, objects, and kids are great at that. So I think that a lot of the intellectual barriers to entry are falling. I mean, obviously, you still need a little money, you need electricity, et cetera, but the point is you can take any computer lab today, add two, D, two 3D printers, and now it's a design lab. And you know, we, we have computer labs and we have arts, art classes, and like the two don't meet each other, and yet, you put two to 3D printers in the computer lab, and now you've got, now you've got the synthesis of the two. And you're not just making, like, you know, you know, uh, finger painting to bring home. You're you're actually taking making your ideas and making them real and learning skills that are basically 21st century competencies. So I, I think that I think that that's that's the really exciting thing here is that this is now kind of if it's if it's easy enough for kids to use, 
is easy enough for everybody to use. And fundamentally, growing up, knowing that you can make your ideas real is going to create the generation of innovators that are going to drive the next industrial revolution. Thank you. Really quick follow-up question. Um, you alluded to your children earlier on. What was actually their level of involvement? I assume that they weren't the ones drawing you know, CAD diagrams or anything like that. Um, so, you know, it's a bit of a sore point. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, their level of involvement is always, um, is always uh, they're, they're very happy to try something once with me. Um, but if it's hard, they lose interest pretty quickly. So although they don't, they, they, they love Lego, Lego Digital Designer um, because they just want to play on screen since one thing we'll let them do, but we won't let them play video games all the time. Um, they um, tend not to use CAD a lot. Instead of what they do is they download files from Thingiverse and then just modify them. Okay. Um, but, you know, given a choice between anything on a screen and not on a screen, they'll, they'll do anything on a screen if we let them. So we, this call, we call this educational and, uh, and they'll do it. Thanks a lot. This was really, really informative. A uh, couple of points, I guess. One was an open question, which is that previously, when you wanted to control sort of dangerous objects or drones and so on, you had export control norms and so right. on. And now you're ending up in a world where you got to control sale of machines that could do anything from produce really helpful houses to like drones, which could be loaded with explosives. And there's a big risk to how do you moderate and control this at the same time, keep the open model. Yeah. So one's like, what's your thoughts on that? So as you might imagine, I get this question a lot. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, open sourcing, open sourcing drones, what could possibly go wrong? Um, I, so the simple answer is that, of course, this is true for any technology. Yeah. You know, you can misuse computers um, a, as well. Um, we feel that we have an obligation to do two things. One is to promote best practice, to promote responsible use. So we are, there was actually, you know, for example, um, um, you're not allowed to fly drones in the U.S. national airspace mm -hmm. for commercial purposes, but you can fly it recreationally as long as you stay below 400 feet and within visual line of sight mm -hmm. so that you can avoid, you can provide that sense and avoid ability to stay out of the way of mandated aviation. Um, uh, we, you know, there are, we know our technology can fly beyond line of sight. We know it can fly be above 400 feet. We are hardcore about, about discouraging that. I mean, anybody posts a video of doing that, we come down on them. We just kind of bang on all the time about safety and responsible um, use and about, about the FAA guidelines. So that's one thing. The second thing is that um, we, uh, we don't feel we're competent to regulate or police this. Um, we think it's our obligation to inform the regulators and, and law enforcement agencies about what's possible and what's happening. So what we do is we reach out to the agencies um, out there and we invite them in. Uh, we tell our community we invite them. You know, I get, a, I get like a quarterly checkup with the FBI. We're like, hey, how's it going? Everything's going fine. <laughs> And, you know, and, we, and we, we say, you know, if anything, if anybody starts talking about something dangerous, we will, we will, call, we will you know, ping, ping our friends in the FBI ASAP. If the FBI sees something's dangerous, we will, we will um, and we disclose this. We actually don't have any information. All we have is their email address, but we will disclose the email address. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and I fly to Washington every now and then to tell everybody what's possible so that, that the people who we have entrusted to protect us are informed about what's possible. And we're really transparent about this with the community, that responsibility, the fun, you know, if somebody messes this up, if somebody does something dangerous, this is going to be bad for everybody. Right. And um, we're just like, you know, do it, do it in public. Um, I, you know, if we, if, if we as a community have a responsibility, if we see something that we think is dangerous or irresponsible to tell people about it, but we don't feel that we can be the ones who ultimately are the police, or we're not going to restrict the technology we release, we're just going to inform the uh, responsible parties about, about what's being released, about what's being done, so that they can do the job. Uh, the other sort of follow-up question, sort of related but not connected, is that as you think about sort of spare parts, this entire change that's going to happen sort of in the next 5, 10, or 15 years of how production and like sort of mass customization is going to happen, where do you see sort of people evolving in their skill sets? Because I think like for people who grew up like with CAT software, if they're engineers, it's easy, but for the rest of them, they're sort of away from that realm of learning. Yeah, well, I think in the same way that you don't think that you're, you're, you're publishing when you post to Facebook, you know, I don't think you're going to think you're doing CAD when you, you know, do reality capture of some object and then, and then make it cooler. Um, I think that basically we're going to abstract the, you know, you know, the opportunity is to abstract the complexity and the professional sort of standards out of this and just make it, come up with a new design interface, a new design language that allows people to express themselves naturally. Awesome. And just for everyone else here as Googlers, there is a garage, which is our shared working space, which also has access to a 3D printer, which I found Sweet. out about today morning. So. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming to speak.
Uh, you just talked about the open hardware movement, and uh, you mentioned MakerBot a lot, and I'm sure you're aware that they seem to have backpedaled slightly on uh, the open hardware movement, and also some concern over the language in Thingiverse's yeah. uh, you know, agreements to what you're giving to them when you upload your models. Is that paranoia on the community's part that something's happening there, or is there something yeah. afoot? And what does that mean for the future of the open hardware movement? Gr great question. Thank you for raising that. Um, and the answer is a little bit of, of both. Um, so here, just the facts for those of you who, who, who aren't familiar with this. Um, MakerBot is built on the RepRap um, uh, you know, platform, which is an open source uh, hardware and software um, platform. Um, uh, MakerBot uh, was 100% open. Um, and in this latest version, the Replicator 2, um, the biggest problem just to put the facts on the table, the biggest problem is not that they're, they've closed it. The biggest problem is they didn't say what they were doing on day one. So there's some ambiguity and people suspected the worst. Um, what they are actually doing, oh, and by the way, the thing of thing was complete misunderstanding. Those terms of service were in place for like a year already and, mm -hmm. and that, was, that was just paranoia. Um, but here's what's actually happening is that they've, they, they've, 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 looked at the, they've looked at the product and they said, what about this? Um, is, is usefully open, which is to say, you know, we get open. We understand that if you give something back, you get more in return, and you know, we, uh, that you create a platform for which innovation can be happens. But there's certain elements that are just sort of not really practical for people. To, for, so, for example, their enclosure, which is powder-coated steel. I mean, you, you need access to machinery that regular people don't have to do that. And they didn't feel that that was really adding a lot of value was the enclosure. Whereas the circuit boards, uh, the electronics themselves are open. They're actually the same ones that were in the previous one. Um, their software, their underlying um, slicing engine, which does the G code, um, is open. Their UI is not um, on the grounds that they, you know, they want to have some some protection, but they felt that the underlying slicing engine was the most useful one to to, to release. So the big problem was they didn't say that on day one. So people kind of went freaked out. Um, uh, the next one, so where they ended up is what we call a hybrid model, which is you open what you think is most useful and really serves the community best, and you close just enough to give yourself a, you know, a, a competitive advantage so that you can build a sustainable business. And I think, I think they got it right. Uh, I'm not going to say they got it 100% right, but I think that a hybrid model is probably the right way to go. So for example, on our drones, we, um, our, our hardware is 100% open. We release the Eagle files. Our software is 100% open, GPL'd. Um, we, when we had laser cut stuff, we released all those as laser cut files. We now have injection molded arms when the designs are in SOLIDWORKS. And we actually release the dimensional drawings, but we don't release the SOLIDWORKS files. Because you'd need an injection molding machine in SOLIDWORKS, which costs $5,000 to use this. And we didn't feel that that was kind of adding a huge amount of value. And we also are constantly ripped off by the Chinese. I mean, just like, you know, not just, I mean, our license allows you to, to use our stuff and compete against us, but it doesn't allow you to <laughs> violate our trademark and not release and not follow, not, not adhere to the terms of the license. Um, so we're like, you know what, these injection molded arms are just going to make it easier for the cloners to rip us off. And they're not adding a lot of value to the community. So that's where we drew the line, right there. Now, I'm sure there's someone out there who thinks we're, we're, we're betraying the cause and we've you know, violated the ethic of open hardware, but we, f we feel that we made a reasonable decision to build a sustainable business and, um, you know, and the truth is actually nobody has complained. <laughs> Maybe they will but now that I've mentioned it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so far so good. So I think that you know, we're all kind of navigating. I, I talked to Bree from MakerBot a lot about this. We're all kind of finding our way towards being you know, mostly, as Raspberry Pi, for example, is not open hardware, they're open software. Um, and I think the, uh, we had a good post on Wired Design the other day where the designer said, you gotta sell a little, sell a lot. Now, that's not exactly the way I would have phrased it, um, but the point is, is that, you know, we're over the, I, you know, we're not, we're not we didn't join a priesthood here. We're, we're doing, we, we, we believe in open source because it works. We, you know, we've done it, we've got years of experience in this. We do it because it's a practical way to build innovation communities, but we're not gonna be, doctrinaire about it. We're going to kind of get the balance right so that we can serve both our community and our customers and our, to be frank, our investors. Um, because these are big businesses now um, uh, best. And that involves being flexible and evolving the model as, as you go. Thank you. There's been some rumblings about uh, 3D printing at a much larger scale, like people printing the walls to houses. Yeah. What do you think is the timeline for that becoming more mainstream, and when can I print out an apartment? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so that is already possible. There's already some, some uh, demos um, using uh, poured concrete and basically big heads. Uh, there's a, one really interesting demo where one of the problems with the you know, sort of you know, house scale 3D printers, which you know, pours, that you actually have to build a 3D printer as big as a house, or slightly bigger, actually. Um, 
there's some really cool demos involving stringing wires from trees. You know, you basically just need three points, right? Like a hammock, mm -hmm. minus one point, <laughs> I guess. Um, so you just, just string wires from trees, cables of various sorts, and then you just let the head, you just kind of calibrate it, and then you let the head kind of move on these wires in a kind of a three-dimensional axis, and you basically created an in-situ, ad hoc, one-off 3D printer for houses. Um, now, this is definitely experimental lab stuff. I wouldn't guarantee the resolution of a, <laughs> of a 3D printer locked to a tree, which can slightly bend a little bit. Um, but, but you can kind of see where this is going. And I think originally they're doing it to kind of as an experiment in building, in making um, concrete shapes that would be too hard to make through traditional casting or, or pouring techniques. Um, so it's kind of an art thing um, right now. But, um, and don't forget, you also have to put in things like rebar, um, et, et, et cetera, so there, there, there is that. But, um, I, you know, but I, I would expect that, um, I can't give you a timeline on, uh, I've seen it work in Italy. Um, I don't know how commercial it is at the moment, but I, mean, I think we're, we're talking, you know, a matter of single digit years. Awesome, thank you. Hi, Chris. Um, so how do you think this revolution, the new industrial revolution, applies also to food products? You know, we have this open right. source community that's creating recipes all the time, but every single person has to know how Absolutely. to cook and have the utensils, right? So you have the spices and all the, like, the ingredients that make food taste a certain way. They can be kind of printed as well, right? Sure. So what do you think? You yeah. Know? So that's, that's the Star Trek replicator, you know, the T Earl Grey hot deal that Captain Picard um, asked okay. for. Um, yeah, Japan has all these machines where you can just decide kind of the flavors of stuff yeah. and it prints out kind of your food. But. Well, you know, we're, we're already there in a trivial sense. The reason the first MakerBot was called a cupcake is that it actually could print icing on a cupcake because icing tends to be a kind of a, like a fluid, it's kind of a, kind of a, 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 a kind of viscous fluid that actually works really well in that, in that particular extruder. Um, or sort of well, actually, I never got working. Um, chocolate is a nightmare, by the way. Oh my God, I had horrible experiences trying to temper chocolate so it would go through the 3D printer. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, so, so, you know, again, there's a trivial answer to this, which is if you've got something that looks kind of like, 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 a, like a goo, Anything, any food that looks like goo, you can put in a 3D printer. Is that, you know, is that, do you want to eat that? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, you know, the more complicated question is, you know, are you going to be able to mix, mix ingredients, you know, at the right temperature and the right consistency at the right time in a way that's better than what you can do by hand? And, um, you know, obviously we have, you know, if you go into, you go into like a cake factory, I mean, I, and I, I, if you go to a cake factory, it's really kind of amazing. They're massive CNC machines. Basically, you know, it's all automated. Um, every cake can be decorated uniquely with a robot, a KUKA robot arm. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's, you know, it's, I wouldn't call it a 3D printer, but it's a complete robot cake factory. Um, and they do mix it, but that's a kind of a custom factory with the ingredients that are really optimized for, for that role. You can't do it on your desktop yet. Um, it's a good question, what would be the first food that you would actually, like a microwave oven, that rather than putting the food in the oven and, and pressing the number, you put a plate in the oven and press the number and the food is kind of generated on it. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what that, what that first food's going to be. Um, I mean, say, for example, pastas, you know, you have all these sauces, different types of, you know, it's like, I mean, I just thinking about like things that are kind of bulk already and you just mix different ingredients in a... Does somebody here know anything about food? <laughs> Can anyone want to hazard a guess on that? <laughs> yes, that's right. You, you have a robotic food machine. <laughs> yeah, um, that's it. I, I wish I knew more about food. I'm, I'm, my, my sense is that, that, that part of food preparation is the pleasure in doing it. It's, so having a robot do it is probably not so much fun. But anyway, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>